Hello, good morning. It's Monday the 29th of April. I'm Anita McVeigh and welcome to BBC Newsroom Live. Victims of crime, including those alleging rape, are being asked to give police access to their phones and social media accounts or risk seeing their case dropped. The move, which applies to England and Wales, is part of measures revealed by the Director of Public Prosecutions to address failures in the disclosure of evidence to defendants. But campaigners say it could discourage victims from going ahead with prosecutions. Our legal correspondent, Clive Coleman, reports. The case of Liam Allen, falsely accused of rape and sexual assault, starkly exposed the problems of police and prosecutors failing to disclose relevant evidence to the defence. Disclosure is the foundation of our fair trial system. The prosecution must disclose evidence gathered by police which either helps the defence case or weakens its own. If that fails, miscarriages of justice can occur. Following several collapsed trials, a series of reviews revealed a system-wide problem. At its core was the ability of police and prosecutors to get on top of unprecedented amounts of digital evidence on smartphones and social media. Under a National Disclosure Improvement Plan, all CPS prosecutors and 93,000 police staff have received specialist training. Disclosure champions have been appointed and management systems used for years in complex terrorism cases are now being used in all rape cases. But most controversial are new forms under which victims and witnesses are asked if they'll consent to have their smartphones examined. If they don't, it might halt a prosecution. It is neither for an investigating police officer nor a prosecuting lawyer to simply speculatively have a look at the content of a mobile phone or laptop computer. That is not what we're asking. That is not what the consent forms are there for. No one's pretending disclosure's easy, but if police and prosecutors can't reassure the public that they can obtain relevant digital evidence and pass that which is helpful to the defence, the future of our fair trial system is in jeopardy. Clive Coleman, BBC News. As we heard in Clive's report, the issue of disclosure came to the fore when several court cases were halted because of evidence not being shared with defence solicitors. One of the defendants affected, Liam Allen, had charges dropped when critical material emerged while he was on trial. A little earlier, he gave us his thoughts on the new proposals. I think it's a good start in, in all honesty. I understand that there are sort of re reservations about it and there is a few concerns in terms of like, people that are working for victims' charities. But it, considering my case, considering how valuable it was that the evidence was actually on the complainant's phone, it's so much more valuable than people realise, and it can be so much more valuable to prosecution cases as well as defence cases. So, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a good step in the right direction, I, but I can understand why people are a little bit concerned with it. I, I don't think it's fair to go through something of seven years' worth of information if it was only an accusation across a year period. Like, that doesn't make any sense because then that is an invasion of privacy. But there are certain things that are related to cases that are going to be in there on either phone. And so both phones should be taken. It's, it's not just one or the other. It should be both. Liam Allen. Uh, let's return now to our main story today, which we were bringing you just a few minutes ago, victims of crime 
including those alleging rape, are being asked to give police access to their mobile phones and social media accounts. Uh, these are under uh, proposals from the Director of Public Prosecutions to address failures in the disclosure of evidence to defendants. Uh, we can talk now to Jocelyn Anderson, who's the Chief Executive at West Mercia Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre. She joins me now from Worcester. Jocelyn, thank you very much for your time this morning. What are your thoughts on these plans? I think it's, it's a very interesting move when you are looking at um, the way that rape investigations and childhood sexual abuse investigations are conducted. Um, there is a need to gather information, but this isn't really anything new. What it is doing is firming up a process that's happened already. What the, the issues with it are is that it's not proportionate, it's not fair, and it's not actually focused on the victim. What, why there do you are, say it's not proportionate, um, fair, phones, and, and, and not focused on the victim? Why do you say those things? If you imagine somebody's mobile phone, and for example, I have a works mobile, I have a personal mobile, this isn't just accessing information about the rape or the child sexual abuse. It's giving access to everybody to your emails to your contacts to your text messages your social media accounts your internet browsing history and when you combine that already with the demand made upon rape victims quite often to hand over medical records um, work records it's a massive intrusion into somebody's life and I think there's also a misconception that sometimes people think you would just hand your phone over the information will be downloaded and then you get it back but it's, it can be gone for weeks, months, years. The quickest I've ever known a phone be handed back is, um, is eight weeks. It's not a short process and it really does impact on people's lives. And when you look that it's the victim's phone that is taken and not the perpetrator's, it seems to be unfair and unbalanced. That, that's, not the, that's not the case though, is it? I mean, in the Liam Allen case, his phone was taken as well. Uh, Jocelyn, I hope you can hear me perhaps having a little bit of difficulty with your earpiece there. Um, in Leon, Liam Allen's yes. case, his phone was taken as well. It's simply not the case that it's just the alleged victim's phones who are taken. When you are looking at, um, we've had a case recently in Worcester um, with a cricketer whose phone wasn't taken. The victim's phone was taken. She went through two trials successively. and his phone wasn't taken until afterwards and when that was when that was then examined there were a lot of misogynist sexist uh, text messages comments that have been accessed different websites and i think if you're going to do an investigation into any crime it needs to be fair and proportionate so, and uh, would you be content if, if um, both phones were taken in every case of this nature is the way ahead for both phones to always be taken both the uh, defendant's phone and the person making the start. accusation. Yeah, it would be a start, it would be more proportionate, but the actual system needs to change. And it can't be used as a fishing expedition. So, for example, if you were um, a victim of childhood sexual abuse and your phone is taken, they can be going back through your records for years and years. When you look at rape cases already, which many, many people, I think it's one in ten people will actually report to the police, People don't want their social lives trawled through. If you look at the way that Facebook images, for example, have been used in rape cases where they've been um, brought out in the court process and people said, well, you look like you were having a good time, you look like you were having fun, you didn't look like you were traumatised. That's not actually evidence, it's a fishing expedition and it's looking at trying to damage somebody's character. It's victim blaming and it's not fair. The people you work with, have you had cases where they have decided not to proceed with an attempt to prosecute someone because they don't want to go through this process that you're describing, handing over their phones, details of their social media accounts, to the police or are there some people who will say, well if this actually leads to a conviction then it's it's worthwhile. I think there is a lot of pressure put on people. Certainly at the centre that I work at, we've had people who've said, I'm not going to hand over my phone. This is my life. This is my works phone. The case I was talking about where the phone came back in eight weeks had to be done specially measured. and There was a lot of pressure put on for that, that phone to be returned. But if you think about your life going for 12 months, all of your work connections, all your contacts, it does make you stop and think. 
And certainly we've had people who've said, I don't want them to access my phone, I don't want those judgments made on me, I'm not going to go any further. And over the past few years, it's been used quite significantly by police as a measure of, and again, this is very judgmental, but if, if you're not going to give us your phone, have you got something to hide? And it's a case of actually, no, I don't want you trawling through everything, forming opinions, seeing what, hap what you think has, has gone on in my life, and then me having to face the consequences of that. Jocelyn Anderson, Chief Executive at uh, the West Mercia Rape and Sexual Abuse Centre, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Now, returning to our top story, victims of crime, including those alleging rape, are being asked to give police access to their phones and social media accounts or risk seeing their case dropped. Here with me now is uh, Claire Waxman, London's Victims Commissioner. Claire, thank you for joining us on uh, BBC Newsroom Live today. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the issues around this and trying to balance sensitivities towards alleged victims with the need to have as much evidence as possible in a case to ensure a, f a, a fair trial? Well, what we're hearing today in the news around these new consent forms, there's nothing really new. Uh, victims have been asked to uh, share very personal and sensitive information, uh, victims of rape, for, for some time. This has uh, got worse over the last year and a half after we saw the collapse rape trials. And it's one of the reasons why I called on the um, Information Commissioner's Office to lead an inquiry, and it's their top inquiry and investigation, into the types of information that victims are being asked to consent and share in order to access justice. So these forms today are really just um, a rehash of the old Stafford statements, but they're giving a bit more information to victims of why um, they're being requested to, to, to disclose uh, information to the police and CPS in order to get a, a, um, access justice and potentially a prosecution. And yes, you're right, we do need to balance uh, the rights of the defendant, but also the rights of the victim, which I feel are being overlooked time and time again through this process, um, and that victims' rights to privacy are not being upheld. Uh why do you feel that the rights of the victim, the alleged victim, why do you think the, the balance isn't right there? Because victims of rape are coming forward and reporting and um, most of the time they're being asked to hand over their phones, um, even if it's not relevant, not reasonable, proportionate, to give um, access to past medical records, social services records, school records, uh, for police to speak to their employers as well. We are absolutely scrutinizing um, victims and we're almost but investigating them. Are they not being asked to hand over their phones likewise? We know in the, the Liam Allen case he certainly was. They are, but often uh, the accused will say, and we've heard it many times, that they don't have their PIN number or they can't give the information to the police. Um, but if the same happens to victims, then the prosecution, we can't go, they can't go forward. So they won't be able to get access to justice um, and CPS won't charge unless they've got access to all this information. And the issues around this is we're asking victims to disclose very personal information that the way we all use our phones, if you actually looked at some of the information, it's the WhatsApp messages or text messages, they're no different from how we used to have conversations conversations with friends, private conversations um, in the coffee shop um, and now that's been trawled through and looked at and analysed and we could look at anybody's um, past medical records or we could look at their digital data and you could pin, pick out anything that might undermine prosecution and that's what we're seeing which is actually reflected in the Home Office figures because prosecutions have plummeted. So at the moment we're seeing this really limiting victims access to justice. So we need a real overhaul of this, we need to really understand what is it that we need to look at what is realistic what is reasonable what is proportionate because at the moment I do think we've had this knee-jerk response to the collapse rape trials and we're now going on this fishing expedition and looking at so much information of the victims is there a way do you think to give victims uh, greater confidence in this system we discussed with Big Brother watch earlier today um, you know the technology that police use to look at social media accounts and to look at mobile phone accounts and whether there was potentially a way for those searches to be to be narrowed for example if there is one person that they're interested in that the search only brings up any communication with that individual uh, either their phone number their name their image is there a way forward there 
Well, that's what we're trying to push for. So instead of taking the phone and doing a total download, which is putting so much pressure on the police as well, you know, they, they don't have the resources to be able to go through these phones. These are, you know, thousands and thousands of pages of information. So um, this is causing a real delay as well to, to the justice process. So yes, absolutely, there must be a way of defining these searches much better, but also ensuring that those people, uh, it's not just the victim, but it's messages between a third party, that you're getting the consent of that third party too. What we're seeing, and it's why I asked the ICO to investigate, is that messages are coming up um, in the courtroom that are being disclosed, not just around the offender, or the accused and, and the victim, but also third party people as well who haven't um, actually given consent for their data to be used in court. And that's very serious. Okay, uh, Claire Waxman, Victims Commissioner for London, thank you very much for your time. Let's uh, return now to our top story, the news that uh, victims of crime, including those alleging rape, are being asked to give police access to their phones and to their social media accounts, or perhaps run the risk of their case not proceeding. Uh, let's get the thoughts now of Nick F. Grave, the National Police Chief's Council's lead for criminal justice. Assistant Commissioner F. Grave, very good to have you with us. We've heard both sides of the coin on this uh, story today, but we've certainly heard a lot of criticism uh, from groups who work with victims of crime, particularly sexual offences, and campaigners concerned about privacy. Um, what do you say to them about these, these concerns? Well, the first thing I say is I understand exactly uh, their perspective, and it's really important that we do not uh, trample over the rights of an individual to have privacy. Of course not. That's a really fundamental right. But it's also the case that we as an, an investigative authority or a pro pros prosecution team need to fulfill our obligations under the disclosure uh, law, which means that we do need sometimes, and not in every case, I stress, but uh, we do on occasion need to understand what might be on a complaint or a victim's mobile phone or other digital device so that we can ascertain whether or not there's material there that will either undermine our case as we're presenting it or potentially assist the case of the... Um, we, we can't avoid that responsibility. That's written to legislation, and it's very difficult to see how one would achieve that without being able to ask the complainants or, or victim to see what's on their phone or other device. And that's what these forms have been designed to do. It's something we've... That's uh, chiefly, uh, if I may interrupt, I presume, in cases where the alleged victim and the suspect uh, know one another. But what about this idea that failure to give consent to access phone and social media records might lead uh, to that case being dropped? Is that happening? It's not happening... Uh, very much at all, um, but it's a very real risk. I mean, one has to consider it in the round. If uh, there is a reasonable reason, if there's a reasonable inquiry to be made that, regarding data that's on a phone, and the person that owns the phone is, is not willing to allow police to look at that, then we have to disclose that fact to the Crown Prosecution Service. And the Crown Prosecution Service would then have to take a view about whether or not that case, in the absence of that, uh, information would be likely to succeed and it, it's possible they would come to the view that it wouldn't be not in every case I mean each case is different each each circumstance is different but there's always that risk uh, and that's what we wanted to alert uh, complainants and victims to it's not fair not to tell them that that risk exists yes yeah, so what assurances can you give uh, victims and alleged victims uh, that uh, when police look at material, whether it's on social media, on a phone, that this isn't just a phishing exercise, that they're not looking at everything that's there, that they're looking specifically perhaps at material relating to an individual, whether that's photographs, a name, uh, a phone number. Well, that's exactly the approach we take. We simply don't have the resource, let alone we've got no inclination either, but no, not the resource to look at everything on a typical uh, mobile phone or more than one device. Uh, but... but but the actual approach is taken is, is one of a reasonable inquiry. So we have to understand what the circumstances of the case are. We have to understand what particular material we might be looking for and then focus our search on that and that alone. Um, to do anything else would be wrong. So what do you say to people who are unsure about whether to come forward, whether to give their consent uh, to use this material? What is going on in terms of police training and use of technology to try to give assurances around privacy? Well, the training um, element is a really a significant piece of work. We, we've engaged on a, on a huge training exercise right across the UK uh, around disclosure and the, the obligations that police officers have. And in terms of technology, um, whilst currently there isn't a single solution that, many, that, that any police force can use, we are piloting a number of technological 
search engine type uh, tools, which may assist officers be very specific in what they're looking for and uh, to allow the, the search to take uh, much less time than it currently does. So I would say to anyone out there that, that thinks they may be a victim of any type of crime, not just um, of a sexual nature, you can trust the police to investigate it diligently and thoroughly. We will not be conducting a speculative search on every device that you own, but it may be the case, depending on the circumstances, that we ask to look at some elements of what's on your phone or device because our duties under disclosure oblige us to do so. And are you doing any work, oh, any outreach, if you like, with uh, groups which work with victims? Yes, we are. So when, when, we, when we wanted to devise a national form that was consistent, we did engage with a number of groups uh, as well as some statutory bodies to try and take their views into account in terms of what the, what the form looks like, the type of information that we, we put in there and the language we use. Uh, that that uh, outreach continues, so I, I'm in no way saying that these forms are perfect and the finished article, uh, and we are always willing to take on um, constructive criticism of them to try and improve them. It's, it's in all our interest to get these forms as, as uh, useful as they can be. Okay, uh, Assistant Commissioner Nick Fgrave from the National Police Chiefs Council, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we're just seeing some comment from the uh, Prime Minister's official spokesperson on this matter. Uh, asked about whether uh, rape victims should hand phones to the police. The Prime Minister's official spokesperson said it was a complex area and whilst disclosure can be a key component to ensure a fair trial, it can also be a source of anxiety. Uh, the spokesperson said the police have said they understand the need to balance a respect for privacy with the need to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry and that the police and CPS will work with the information commissioner to make sure the right approach is being taken. Um, the Prime Minister's spokesman uh, went on to say we want victims to have the confidence to come forward and report crimes knowing they will get the support they need and that everything will be done to bring offenders to justice. Hello everyone, this is Afternoon Live. I'm Simon McCoy. Victims of rape and other crimes are being told they may have to hand over their mobile phones to the police or risk prosecutions not going ahead. Police forces in England and Wales are rolling out consent forms which ask for permission to get access to messages, photos, emails and social media accounts. It's a response to the collapse of a string of rape and sexual assault cases after crucial evidence emerged on mobile phones at the last minute. Our legal correspondent Clive Coleman reports. There's going to be evidence in everyone's you know, phone. Liam Allen was falsely accused of rape. The case against him only collapsed when text messages from his accuser, which proved his innocence, were disclosed days into his trial. He favours complainants being asked for their consent to hand over their mobile devices. I can't consider it an invasion of privacy because it assists, there's something in there that will either assist the case or assist the defence. And that needs to be, you know, the police need to have access to that, otherwise they're never going to, you know, there's no right to a fair trial then, that, that's gone. To ensure our fair trial system, the prosecution has to disclose to the defence any evidence gathered by the police that either assists the defence case or undermines the prosecutions. And because of the way we all live our lives today, a lot of that evidence is found on these things. Following a series of collapsed trials, a number of reviews revealed a system-wide disclosure problem. At its core was the ability of police and prosecutors to get on top of unprecedented amounts of digital evidence. Under a national disclosure improvement plan, all CPS prosecutors and 93,000 police staff have received specialist training. Disclosure champions have been appointed and management systems used in complex terrorism cases are now being used in all rape cases. But most controversial are new forms under which witnesses and victims, including victims of rape, are asked if they'll consent to have their devices examined. If they don't, it might halt a prosecution. Will they cooperate? I'm optimistic that if properly explained and communicated, the reference point of what we're calling a consent form for access to digital data where it is reasonable and necessary in any given case uh, will succeed. And the reason I'm confident is that uh, the people of this country historically have always supported criminal investigation and prosecution. But campaigners are worried. It's massively intrusive. 
it really has an impact on victims of rape who may be um, severely traumatised already by what's happened. It's another violation, in effect, um, of, of traumatised victims. Um, and what's more, the danger is that it would deter victims from coming forward. Striking the balance in the digital age between protecting victims and the accused's right to a fair trial is complex. But if the correct balance isn't found, the future of our fair trial system is in jeopardy. Well, a little earlier, Clive explained why the future of our legal system may be in that jeopardy. If you like, the quid pro quo is that to ensure you get a fair trial, uh, the prosecution have to disclose to you, the defendant, any evidence that's been gathered by the police which might assist your case or undermine the prosecution's. That's really the foundation of our fair trial system. And so if we can't have confidence that the, the authorities are able, to, first of all, to locate the relevant evidence uh, and then to disclose that evidence to the defendant uh, where it assists the defendant's case, then a real foundation of the system is shaken. But with the best intent in the world, the challenge of going through this sort of data in this digital age, I mean, is huge. It's staggering. I mean, the Justice Committee, which wrote a pretty stinging report on this last July, called it the digital crater. If you think something like, you know, a normal mobile phone has you know, more computing power than NASA had when it, the first uh, moon landings were launched, you know, if you were to download the contents of this phone, uh, Nick F. Grave, who's an assistant commissioner at the Met, uh, said he'd done a calculation, said if you you were to download the contents of a normal smartphone, print them up on A4 sheets of paper, put them on top of each other, you'd have a column two miles high. Add to that the complexity of how you search these things. How do you search text speak where people aren't talking in whole words, they're talking in part words, abbreviations, emojis. This is throwing massive challenges at the system at a time when the system has sustained very significant cuts. The police have, the Crown Prosecution Service have. Um, and it's, it's, you know, probably the ultimate challenge, I think, facing the system at the moment. But if you are the victim <coughs> of sexual assault or rape and you go and report it to the police, you are a victim, you're immediately going to be feeling <coughs> like a suspect if they're starting to say, well, we want your phone. Particularly if it's, say, a stranger rape where the phone would have no uh, application yeah. at all. Well, look, I mean, this isn't going to be applied absolutely in a blanket way across the board. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You know, and when you mentioned a stranger rape, but I gather that one of the women who is bringing a legal challenge, that was in relation to a stranger rape, because once the defence put in the defence statement, and if the defence statement is, you know, that the sex was consensual, then the police have to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. So even in that sort of case, it is possible that the police would seek the consent of the victim uh, to scrutinise their mobile phone. And the reason for this, Simon, is that we saw late 2017, early 2018, a string of cases go wrong where there was this, if you like, exculpatory evidence that benefited the defendant. And it was lying on mobile phones and on uh, victims and complainants' mobile phones. In the Liam Allen case, it was days into his trial before that evidence, which he'd been asking for for months and months and months and saying, look, there is this exculpatory evidence. It was only uh, disclosed very, very late on when the trial had already started. Now, you know, if, if, if he hadn't got hold of that, that could have been a serious miscarriage of justice. And, you know, it is an unpalatable truth that in a small minority of cases, complainants do make false allegations. Now, in order to protect people against that very small number of cases, um, we have these disclosure rules, which mean that, you know, the defendant gets any evidence which prosecutors and investigators locate which assists their case. I've come and talked to him a little earlier. Let's get more now on the news that victims of rape and other crimes are being asked to hand over their mobile phones to the police or risk prosecutions not going ahead. Police forces in England and Wales are rolling out consent forms which ask for permission to get access to messages, photos, emails and social media accounts. With me in the studio, Sue Casey, a senior domestic and social, uh, sexual violence practitioner. I'm also joined by Christiana hayward Carabas, a defence solicitor who's worked on the defence team for rape suspects and joins me now from Westminster. So if, if I could start with you, what is your main concern about this? The concerns are that um, this is personal information that's been requested um, to be used within a court or criminal justice or police process. Um, and it can be perceived as quite intrusive for those victims who are going through that process. Um, yeah. Christiana Haywood 
Kurabas, if, I, if I, let me put that point to you because there, there is a concern that with, with all that is involved in making that decision to go and report a crime like this to the police, you are a victim that you are feeling once again victimized as soon as you walk into the police station. Yes, I, I think you have to balance the, um, the rights of the complainants and the rights of those who are accused of sometimes extremely serious cases uh, and sometimes cases involving rape. Um, one of the biggest problems is that if you do not have this evidence from uh, those complainants, it may be that the defendant cannot prove uh, for many, many months, uh, his side of the story. Now, you have to take it right back to the police. The police may ask for mobile phone evidence. They will then use key searches. So they don't look at every single message or every single photographs. They may ask just, they may put in just keyword searches. From those keyword searches, they may pick out various messages and that evidence may be used and may be given to the CPS. Sue, the Crown the, Prosecution so, Service... Christiana, sorry, can I just... Sorry, forgive me, I just want to put that to Sue. Does, does that in any way allay your fears over this? No, not really, because there can be uh, contact, so contact between the complainants and um, the, def the person who's defending themselves, contact in whatever form it may be, social media or um, mobile phones or text messages or emails, does not disprove that uh, an act of sexual violence has taken place. And that personal information, they can have contact. That doesn't prove that it didn't happen. And I think we need to be really careful that the message that may be going out to those who want to report uh, sexual violence is that their information will be asked and requested for and would the message be that they may be coerced to give in the consent for this to take place so that, that they can go to trial. Christiana, I mean, I, I, you I know worked on two cases last year where yes. this evidence was crucial. Yes. Um, in, in one particular case the, uh, the accused in the police station said if you look at my phone if you look at my wife's phone, you will see we were not in the same cities at the time. Some very, very serious matters were alleged against my client. Now, if the police, upon receiving the complaint, had been able to access the complainant's telephone, they would have been able to establish that what she was saying was completely untrue. But, but wouldn't it's it be fair, sorry to pick up on that case, wouldn't it be fair if the defendant in that case said, look, just get access to her phone and let the police do the work given, at that point? He had given the police his own phone. And the problem is that the police and the CPS are under a huge amount of pressure of time. And it took them from August until November for them to download his phone, not even her phone, to download his phone and look at it. And once the CPS had looked at it, they decided that they were not uh, going to pursue the prosecution. Now, the problem with that was that he was held in custody from August until November. And uh, that is at a huge cost to the public purse. And that could have been dealt with if they had looked at her telephone at the police station with certain key words, for example, his name. Sue, so, so, I mean, sadly, false accusations are made. If the defendant was a friend, a relative of yours, you would want the police to have access to any information that might prove well, important. But what we think, for me, and practitioners and services who support those that have experienced sexual violence, 
is that we need to think about things in context in that the amount of cases where their allegations have been made and they have been, let's just say, proved to be, to be false accusations, compared to those that actually are experiencing sexual violence and continue to experience it, young people, women, men as well, that may want to come forward and report to the police, then if there's a case where it's bl it is in the media about a false allegation, that's, what's, that's what is in the forefront, and that can be a barrier for anybody to want to come forward and report. Sue, it's very good to come in. Sue Casey, thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. And also Christiana Hayward Carabas, thank you very much. Victims of rape and other crimes are being told they must hand over their mobile phones to the police or risk prosecutions not going ahead. Police forces in England and Wales are rolling out consent forms which arch, ask for permission to get access to messages, photos, emails and social media accounts. It's a response to the collapse of a string of rape and sexual assault cases after crucial evidence emerged on mobile phones at the last minute. Our legal correspondent Clive Coleman reports. There's going to be evidence in everyone's you know, phone. Liam Allen was falsely accused of rape. The case against him only collapsed when text messages from his accuser, which proved his innocence, were disclosed days into his trial. He favours complainants being asked for their consent to hand over their mobile devices. I can't consider it an invasion of privacy because it assists, there's something in there that will either assist the case or assist the defence and that needs to be, you know, the police need to have access to that otherwise they're never going to, you know, there's no right to a fair trial then, that, that's gone. To ensure our fair trial system, the prosecution has to disclose to the defence any evidence gathered by the police that either assists the defence case or undermines the prosecutions. And because of the way we all live our lives today, a lot of that evidence is found on these things. Following a series of collapsed trials, a number of reviews revealed a system-wide disclosure problem. At its core was the ability of police and prosecutors to get on top of unprecedented amounts of digital evidence. Under a National Disclosure Improvement Plan, all CPS prosecutors and 93,000 police staff have received specialist training. Disclosure champions have been appointed and management systems used in complex terrorism cases are now being used in all rape cases. But most controversial are new forms under which witnesses and victims, including victims of rape, are asked if they'll consent to have their devices examined. If they don't, it might halt a prosecution. Will they cooperate? I'm optimistic that if properly explained and communicated, the reference point of what we're calling a consent form for access to digital data where it is reasonable and necessary in any given case uh, will succeed. And the reason I'm confident is that uh, the people of this country historically have always supported criminal investigation and prosecution. But campaigners are worried. It's massively intrusive. It really has an impact on victims of rape who may be um, severely traumatised already by what's happened. It's another violation, in effect, um, of, of traumatised victims. Um, and what's more, the danger is that it would deter victims from coming forward. Striking the balance in the digital age between protecting victims and the accused's right to a fair trial is complex. But if the correct balance isn't found, the future of our fair trial system is in jeopardy. Clive Coleman, BBC News. Well, we can speak now about this to Dame Vera Baird, who is the Police and Crime Commissioner for Northumbria. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. So is this, do you think, uh, a violation of traumatised victims, or does this help ensure a fair trial? No, it doesn't make any difference to a fair trial, I'm afraid. The documentation in the Liam Allen case was there already. It had nothing to do with not having got it from the complainant. What you see here is not a new um, position. All police forces have had the individual forms, some requiring much disclosure, some requiring little. You may think that in itself says a lot about views on relevance. Now this is a universal form for all police forces, which has levelled it up to the top 
of disclosure. So the consent is requested, it is made clear in the document for a full disclosure of the whole content of the phone, plus the de deleted mails, which is the second level, uh, plus work that can be done at a, a laboratory to get further material off, that's the third level. So the basic bottom level is download the lot. And you're given that explanation and asked, uh, made clear that they're looking for material that's relevant to the case. But still, we have seen many, many cases, and even Max Hill, you know, agrees that the CPS have over-required disclosure from rape complainants in the past. And we see appalling cases where material from long ago in a young woman's history has brought off a mobile phone. It has nothing to do with the case, but it might not make her look particularly likable. It's disclosed to the defence and it's thrown at her in cross-examination. That's not a way to pursue a fair trial. The difficulty is not handing over your phone, it's what's done with the content of it. And officers have just historically felt free to trawl and absolutely through. This is done in no other case but rape. Mm. Why but, but, is but, it necessary? But, but so you don't believe when the Director of Public Prosecutions says that digital devices will only be looked at when they form, quote, a reasonable line of inquiry, you're saying you don't accept that that's what's going to happen? He will be sticking to his principles quite appropriately, and I don't want to question that in any sense. But our experience, and in Northumbria in particular, we have a pilot of legal representation for complainants in rape cases to look at disclosure issues. And I can tell you that police say they have done an inquiry, they have pursued all reasonable lines, they may have found some small matter by asking the complainant, how long did you know the man? And looking at what's on her phone, if there are any exchanges there. They have sent the case to the Crown Prosecution Service, who have come back and said, I'm sorry, you need to download the whole lot and search through it, or we won't even consider charging. Now, if Max Hill is to say this is about fair trials, he has to alter radically the culture in his own organisation to stop that from happening, because that is exactly what your uh, interviewee was saying a few minutes ago. It is about putting the woman on trial because of the earlier content, quite irrelevant, of her phone, but which might be disclosed to the defence if the police think that it should. And in no other kind of case is that kind of trawl of a person's background ever gone through. Why is it in rape that it should be so? I, I hear what you say and I hear your concerns, but at the same time, do you not accept we've had a real problem in the criminal justice system with a, a whole string of rape and sexual assault cases that collapsed after criminal evidence emerged at the last minute? I'm sorry to say that that is not the right approach. What happened was a very large number of cases collapsed and a very small number of those were rape and sexual offences. Most of them had absolutely nothing to do with rape and sexual offences. Those were appalling cases, all of them, including the rape ones, and relevant material must be disclosed. But a licence to dredge through somebody's entire background, as evidenced on the mobile phones, which you well know we all live on now, is very, very far from, from, from confining the investigation to what is relevant. The material in those rape cases was in the possession of the police already. It has nothing to do with needing more draconian powers to extract it from victims. Police have been able to extract that relevant material from victims since the 1996 Act, which set up the requirement that they should do all reasonable lines of inquiry. This is, I'm afraid, a significant intrusion into rape complainants' privacy, which is likely, frankly, to prove a bit of deterrent to them, uh, making a report, or if they find, having made a report, that, you know, even if the person may turn out to be a serial rapist, actually, the CPS are not prepared to prosecute him, however powerful their case is, unless they'll hand over their entire life history on their phone. Uh, good to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time this evening. That's Dame Vera Baird, QC Police and Crime Commissioner for Northumbria. Many thanks.
Let's revisit a story from earlier. Victims of rape and other crimes are being told that they must hand over their mobile phones to the police or risk prosecutions not going ahead. Police forces in England and Wales are rolling out consent forms which ask for permission to get access to messages, photos, emails and social media accounts. Well, we can talk about this now with Harriet Wistrich, a solicitor working at civil liberties firm Bernberg. Pierce, and also I'm joined by Sarah Green, the director of the End Violence Against Women Coalition. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, if I can just start with you, Harriet, what do you make of these proposals? Are they necessary? Yes, yes could I just correct? Um, I'm, I'm actually working, uh, the, the, the legal case we're bringing is on behalf of the Centre for Women's Justice, which I'm director, not, not Bernberg Pierce. Okay, sorry uh, about that. Uh, and we're, we're, we're seeking to um, bring a legal challenge around this, uh, these new consent forms because we think that they're entirely disproportionate and excessive in terms of the requests for disclosure. We're not opposed to... We, we understand that disclosure is a proper part of any criminal prosecution, but it should be only disclosure that is relevant to the offence that's being um, uh, investigated, not a crawl through somebody's past personal detailed intimate data sometimes going back years um, in order to investigate a, a, a non-consensual sexual uh, you know a rape basically on 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 a, on a different occasion it's not relevant to trawl through personal histories and and se personal sexual history in the background Sarah Green, would you agree with that or would you say that actually the people who are accused of these very, um, you know, difficult crimes also, you know, have to be protected from people who might be fabricating evidence? Um, I do agree with Harriet and I think it's uh, not a surprise that uh, many campaigners but also many MPs and uh, many people have stepped up today and said, hang on. What are these proposals and what exactly did the police and the prosecution service think they should be able to do from the very beginning of a rape investigation? And I want to say very clearly as well that women's organisations, those of us who support survivors, those of us who really want to see changes in the way rape is treated in this country, we are not opposed to and trying to stop defendants getting a fair trial and having all of their rights protected. But there's something very peculiar going on when the police and prosecution service call for very, very full belt embraces, blanket access to a victim's uh, mobile phone, other devices. But also, actually, they are after her health records, her social services records, if she has any, sometimes asking to uh, keep whatever they find on file for many, many years. There's something going wrong when we approach rape that way and when we completely fail to look at the fact that the victim here is a witness in the trial actually with less rights than the defendant and that she is a human being with privacy and who may well have suffered very serious trauma. So we're getting it wrong and we need to start again with the conversation about what is fair and what should be okay in such an investigation. And Harriet, I mean, obviously anyone who's, who's gone through this sort of assault, the last thing they're going to want, I imagine, is this sort of further intrusion because it, it will feel like a, a further, you know, well, attack on their yeah. privacy. But at the same time, in a way, if they've, they've got nothing to hide, then if the police are going through um, their previous records, that's just standing up the fact that they are of good character, isn't it? And that it helps bring their case, helps to nail it through the courts. That's the point. You, you, you don't, there is no other crime that you report. You, if you report a burglary or being assaulted in the street or some other criminal offence, you're not expected to have your whole history exposed and trawled through in case there's something in there that said, oh, this person was burgled before, this could be relevant. No, it's not relevant. And, uh, you know, this, this is, rape victims are, are treated in a distinct way that is different from any victim of any other crime. And uh, it's, it's not acceptable. And, 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 and the important point to remember is we have the most appalling uh, prosecution rate for rape victims. Many rape victims don't report. Those that do report, only, it, the figures are so low, it's under 2% that end in a conviction. So what, what the result of all these measures are, apart from being an intrusion into privacy, is that, they, that we have um, impunity for rapists, and many more rapists will get away with it, because they know that women won't want to go through this incredibly 
harrowing and intrusive experience. But Sarah, if, if, if I could just bring in Sarah finally, um, you know, if, as we've heard, some cases have fallen at the last minute and therefore that makes the whole prosecution system tougher, then, you know, at the end of the day, if having this data handed over helps a conviction go through, isn't that a price that's worth paying if you're a victim? Um, I think we have to really look at the way the questions um, come across sometimes. And I know these are questions people want to ask. But if you say things like, if you've got nothing to hide, and isn't it all in the interests of justice to make you do this? We've got to really think about what rape is and the harm it does. So if you're asking somebody, can I have basically everything that's in your phone, like everybody who wants to join this debate, you think about what's surrendering your phone, all the images, all the private conversations that are on it. Think about how that feels and what that means. There might be other stuff on there that you don't want the police to have access to, even though a really serious crime has been committed against you. And I think it's also important that we, we tend to treat rape victims as though they are um, supposed to be martyred and just be there for the sake of public justice being done. But actually, you know, even things like the fact that a smartphone is an expensive item, phone contracts are, cost a lot of money and phone companies are not good about transferring numbers over. If you're asked to, get, to hand over your phone right now as you give your first interview, what does that mean? The implications of that are huge. I work with my phone I've, and that kind of thing. Lots of people do. I can't afford to just hand it over and the police and prosecution service are not saying, for example, we'll provide spare phones or we've brokered something with the phone companies. There's just this expectation on rape victims that you have to behave in a certain way and examining all this material is about going back to sexual history and what kind of woman are you and we're supposed to have put that aside by now. Okay, Sarah Green and Harriet Wistrich, thank you both very much for your time today. Thank you. Welcome.